All right. So solutions number five. It's been a good series so far. I don't know about for you, but it has changed a lot of things for me. As I was planning the series, I knew we had to change our thinking. We had to get out of the mindset that everything is a problem and things are so overwhelming and I just can't handle all of this. And we had to start thinking of ourselves as solutions. That's why I don't think I've mentioned this at all throughout the series, but that's why I had Aaron design that bumper to be the way it is. I wanted it to be like a, like a news ticker of good, positive affirmations that I can think about myself. So those things are playing in my mind like a news ticker and not all of the negative. It's, it's the negative stuff that weighs us down. And so the very first week, that's what we focused on, right? We focused on taking our thoughts captive, forcing them to come under the authority of Jesus Christ. The second week, we looked at Queen Esther, if you remember that week, and how she moved from a victim mindset to a victorious stance, how she moved from victim to victor, how she asked for help, how she fasted and prayed and used wisdom in her situation. And I haven't I actually just made this connection in my mind as I'm saying it, but she wasn't even with the people of God physically, like we can't be, but she still asked for help. They fasted and prayed with her, even though they couldn't be physically with her, and helped her move from a victim to victor to be a solution in her situation and in her world of problems. The third week of the series, we looked at how sometimes God asks us to sacrifice something to be a solution, how he asks us for even just a little bit of obedience and, and how that little bit of obedience in the hands of God can be a solution for so many, like in the story we see of, of Hannah and Samuel. Last week, week four, we looked at how David, by the power of the Holy Spirit, was able to say, I'll go. I'll go and fight, even when no one else will. When everybody else is shaking in their boots, they're, they're running and they're afraid, I'll go and fight. He was a solution for his people. And we have access to that same Holy Spirit to allow us to be solutions as well. And although I do feel a stirring in my heart towards our next series I'm really excited about, we're going to start the first week of June because we have Tim Bennett next weekend. Uh, I, I also really felt like we're not quite done here, that there's still a little bit we need to sum up in solutions, a little bit more that God has for us. Over the past 30-something days, we've also been doing a, a Bible plan together, right? Fasting from wrong thinking. We're correcting our thoughts. That's actually what those, those ticker um, statements that I mentioned from the solutions bumper, they're from that plan. Right? I am the right things, not, not thinking about all of the wrong and the negative things in our lives. And so we've been doing this Bible plan together. And honestly, they've all been super helpful. In fact, I didn't tell him I was doing this, but Matt, who is sitting behind the camera right now, is the only person who has commented on every single week <laughs> or every single day of this Bible plan. But I want to celebrate him for that a little bit. But so many of you have commented from, on various days of this Bible plan. I know you're getting so much out of it like I am. But today, I really wanted to focus on one of the days of the 40. We're actually going to finish it up this week. But day 28... The thought that we are fasting from on day 28 was, this is a scary time to be living in. This is a scary time to be living in. How many times have you heard that throughout this past 11 weeks of craziness in our, our world and our culture? I mean, this is a scary time to be living in is what probably everybody feels at multiple points throughout their day, no matter what your opinion is on all of this happening in our world. This is a scary time to be living in. But it's also a thought that we have to fast from. We have to resist. It's more about our thinking than it is our, our actions, right? Our victim mindset. We can get into this victim mindset and ways of thinking, and we have to learn how to live in obedience and do it all through the power of the Holy Spirit. But in this day and time, I have seen a lot of Christians do this badly. I've seen a lot of Christians try hard. They think they're applying the word. They think they're applying scripture, but they're just twisting it a little bit. Here's what I mean. 
Instead of allowing the Holy Spirit to renew our minds, sometimes we just change our language. We're still thinking, I'm a victim, the world is so scary, everybody's out to get me, but out of our mouth comes, I'm more than a conqueror, right? We're not actually allowing God to change our thinking, we're just using Christianese to to fit in with the other Christians, instead of actually allowing the Holy Spirit down deep enough to change our thoughts, our mindsets behind it. Or, or, you know, instead of moving out of that victim mindset, we just reassign the bully, right? We're still the victim, but now the world is out to get me. The, the enemy, Satan, is, is out to get me. Maybe it's not God anymore. Before we were Christians, we thought God was mad at me. Now we know he's not, but we, we just reassigned the bully. We're still the victim. The world is out to get me. Satan is out to get me. Instead of living in obedience, we're just hiding the selfishness in religion. It's not quite what we're talking about in the solutions series. It has to go deeper than that. We're not listening to the Holy Spirit. We just think we are sometimes. Jesus and the Holy Spirit are one and the same. Jesus gave us a prime directive. He gave us a purpose, a calling, a goal in life. Go into all the world and preach the good news. That is what we're called to do. We are not called to cower in fear, to protect our rights at all costs, to to maintain the way of life that we're so accustomed to. We're called to preach the gospel in season and out of season, whether it's easy or whether it's hard. That's our calling. We have to maintain that focus. So we have to fast from the thought that this is a scary world to live in because we have to go out into the world and we have to fish for people. It affects our calling when we, when we take on that mindset. And so for, straight from the plan, and you can still join us in the last couple days of the plan if you go to the sermon notes and click the link. Uh, But today we're going to actually take a bit more of a a practical approach straight from the plan. And we're going to tackle how to actually do this in our world. How to actually stop thinking that this is a scary world to live in and take on that solutions mindset. And so number one, the plan told us from Luke 10, 19, know your authority. Know your authority. Luke 10, 19 says, behold, Jesus said this, I have given you authority over all all the power of the enemy, over all the power of the enemy, meaning Satan doesn't push us around. The enemy, the devil, he, he doesn't get to push us around. Evil doesn't get to push us around. Selfishness doesn't get to push us around. We push it around. We have the authority. Whatever we bind on earth is bound in heaven, Matthew 18, 18 says. And you're never afraid of what you have authority over, right? You are in charge, Sometimes we think we know that, but then we catch ourselves in situations, you know. I sometimes have to remember just when I'm walking on the church property, right? Not because I'm the pastor. I actually did this even when I was a kid's pastor, right? Because my leaders had, had taught me that I am in authority, spiritual authority, when I walk on the church grounds, So I don't let other things push me around. I don't let things distract me from the the purpose and the goal that I am there, which is to preach the gospel because I am in authority. Like Jason said on Wednesday night, right? You have authority over your spiritual self, you. You are in charge of your spiritual disciplines, of your spiritual growth, of your spiritual learning, not the church, not the pastor, you. You are in charge the enemy can take a lot of your methods of growing, but he cannot take the message of Jesus Christ from you. He can never touch it. The methods may change. And sometimes I get a ton out of reading my Bible. Sometimes I feel like I don't hear from that, and, and I get a ton out of worship, or a ton out of my prayer time, or a ton out of fasting. It, it, the methods change. That's why God gave us so many spiritual disciplines, so we can use them all. They are tools in our arsenal to use. Don't get stuck on one, because just as you do, the method changes, and God speaks to you in a different way. Know your authority. You are in charge, and put your mind in that headspace. I am in charge. I have the authority given to me by Jesus Christ. Number two, the plan told us, receive peace as a gift. 
receive peace as a gift. John 14, 27 says, Jesus said again, my peace I give you, not as the world gives. My peace I give you. Meaning, it's, peace is not subject to our external circumstances. We just simply accept peace. No matter the circumstance, even if there's a storm raging or we're in a boat on water, we step out in peace. That's what the Gospels teach us. We receive peace, not as something that's dependent on our circumstances. And I think we get this flipped a lot. Even as Christians, we say, God, if you could just take care of all of these external issues and problems and people coming at me, and if you could just take care of all of those things, then I could be peaceful. God's saying, no, I prepare a table before you in the presence of your enemies, not in their absence. I prepare a table before you. You can sit down and eat in peace and joy, my provision for you, even when there's enemies out there. Receive peace as a gift. Meaning you you can't earn enough money to finally be at peace. You can't trust another person enough to finally be at peace. There's not enough control or, or money or power on planet Earth for you to finally be at peace. Peace is given. And peace can be accepted. Therefore, we don't have to be afraid. Therefore, we don't have to be afraid. We, we even get this twisted as Christians sometimes, right? We think that God has guaranteed our safety and so... We can do whatever we want, and he's going he's gonna to back us up. He's going to protect us, right? But what happens when you get kidney failure and no amount of praying fixes it? I'm speaking from my own personal. If you don't know me, my husband had kidney failure. We struggled with it for 18 months. So it was terrible and awful, and he almost died a few times. And, and we prayed and we prayed, and it didn't get fixed in quite the way we thought it would. God provided, God protected, God healed him, but not in the way we were hoping for. And we had to struggle through that. Now on the other side, our faith is stronger than ever. We know that we know that we know that God has us, not because he removes every obstacle and struggle and hard circumstance, because he's with us through it. We cannot get this twisted. Peace is a gift no matter what you're going through. And sometimes we, we think that God has guaranteed our prosperity, right? Because we, we claim his promises. And so what happens when the economy tanks and we lose our business, right? What happens then? God does keep his promises. It, it might not be always in the way that you expect. But bad things in God's kingdom are not always bad things. We can remain peaceful even through the storms, not because God will spare us pain, but because he still brings good from pain. He is with us through the pain, and we can be peaceful because of that, not because he spares our things and our people. He protects our little world of of happiness because we've released our attachments to things and, and even to people, unlike the world does. We have Jesus. Take the world. But give me Jesus. He is all we need and peace is a gift. Number three, the plan told us. Remember what you have and what you have not. We've mentioned this verse a couple of times this service so far. But 2 Timothy 1.7 says, God has not given you a spirit of fear, but of power, love, and a sound mind. God has not given you a spirit of fear, but of power, love, and a sound mind. A lot of people out there in the world, they say, you know, churches uh, close during the season, proving that they have a spirit of fear, proving they don't actually believe what they say they believe. To me, it proves that we have a spirit of love, self-discipline, right? It proves we have a sound mind. It proves we're, we're using the power that God has given us to show the world that we care more about them than, than the money, the momentum, the congregants we may have lost by closing. We have a spirit of love. That's why we close. Spirit of community and, and being a servant to our community. We don't have a spirit of fear. Uh, that's not to say if you feel fear occasionally that, that you aren't saved or something, right? I, f- I feel it too. We can feel fear sometimes and still not live in a spirit of fear because we resist fear. 
we apply the principles and the power and the promises of God to our fear. We resist it. We don't allow that spirit of fear to dwell on us or in us. We accept God's spirit. And God's spirit cannot be threatened. He is invincible, impenetrable, immovable, all powerful, all knowing. He cannot be threatened. And we have his spirit dwelling within us. Number four, take your daily dose of prescripture as your new prescription. I know it's cheesy. It's from the plan. I didn't write it, but it's true. <laughs> take your daily prescripture as your new prescription. Psalm 91 10 should be taken as a daily dose, right? No evil or harm shall befall you, nor shall any disaster or plague come near your tent. We apply the promises and principles of Scripture to our fear. We apply them to our lives. And the Scriptures teach us to put on joy like clothes. Not just do it all by yourself. Not just be more than you are, but put it on using the power of Scripture. Scripture can change you from the inside out. It can heal you from the inside out. It can inspire you and motivate you to new levels of creativity, new ideas and motivation and vision for the future within you. It, it can help you forgive things you never thought you could. And not just move on from the past, but actually heal from it. That is the power of this book. It's not just a book. It is the living, breathing word of God. If, if we actually believed that, we treat it as such. We wouldn't let it gather dust on the shelf while we watch Netflix. We treat it as the living, breathing word of God that can change our lives from the inside out. And that is how we, one of the ways that we can fast from the idea that the world is a scary place. The Bible gives us boldness, right? Like the verse we uh, went over in our Bible trivia, the godly are as bold as lions, the wicked flee, though no one pursues them, but the godly are as bold as lions. Number five, meditate on good news from Job. This is what the plan said. I know there's not a whole lot of good news in Job, but just hang with me. Job 5.19 says, he will deliver you from six troubles. In seven, no evil shall touch you. Now, if you know the book of Job, it does. <laughs> It's a hard pill to swallow, right? But Job is a lesson for us on how to deal with loss and how to deal with it when life doesn't seem to go your way and when God seems to sort of be behind that, right? Not by, we don't deal with it by shaking our fists and in anger at God, not by complaining to him like Job did, but by understanding that God's universe is so much bigger than just me. God's universe, the, the creation that God has built, that he spoke into being. It's so much bigger than just me. And he's got this. He knows what he's doing. We can trust him. Meditate on that. That is actually what worship does. It focuses your mind and your, your thoughts, your mindsets on who he is. He is so much bigger than just me and my world. He's got this. He can handle it and I can trust him. Number six, love conquers all. Love conquers all. Romans 8, 38 through 9 is, is the verse we're going to focus on for this one. As you fill your mind with God's love towards you, fear leaves. It flees under any circumstance. God's Love is actually what helped me overcome my own anxiety issues I had growing up, a crippling self-doubt. I was in, stuck in this cycle and trap of shame. His love made me into the bold and brave leader that I am called to be, and it continues to shape me into that. None of us, none of that is threatened by a virus or the government or the enemy in the world. None of that can be threatened by people or any physical force known to man because nothing can separate me from God's love. Neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither our fears for today nor our worries about tomorrow, not even the powers of hell can separate us from God's love. No power in the sky above 
or in the earth below. Indeed, nothing in all creation will ever be able to separate us from the love of God that is revealed in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Nothing can separate us. No power in the sky above or in the earth below. Nothing can separate us from his love. Love conquers all. In the darkest of times, God presents his most stunning performances. Expect God to show up. Expect him to show up. He's there whether we expect him or not, but when we expect him, we are able to see his intervention and hands on our lives so much easier. As the world gets darker, our light shines brighter. Again, the kingdom cannot be threatened. I, I will never understand uh, the very Christian mindset when we constantly think that the kingdom is threatened somehow. Right? That if, if we don't vote the right way, if Christians don't get in government, if, if we don't throw a fit at every R-rated movie and, and boycott every business that, that disagrees with us, if, if we don't try to manipulate culture into our ideals that we're going to lose something. We're not going to lose. I've read the end of this story. We don't lose. We don't lose. There's nothing that can threaten the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God advances because his word is true. We cannot be threatened. Don't get me wrong. I'm not saying Christians shouldn't be in government and we shouldn't uh, try to get justice done in our world because Christians are really good at that. God gave us a purpose on this earth to change the world with the message of the gospel. We can do all of that, but the kingdom cannot be threatened. Our nation is not the kingdom. Our, our church is not the kingdom. People, places, and things are not the kingdom. The kingdom is in here. The kingdom is, is a mindset. It's in hearts and minds and souls. The kingdom is Christ Jesus. And as the world gets darker, he shines brighter. The world is not getting scarier and scarier. It's been scary since the dawn of creation, when Adam and Eve chose to disobey God. It's not getting more and more scary. The world's been scary ever since then, when we as humans introduced selfishness and sin into the world. Someday God's going to fix all of that. We know the end of the story, right? But today is not that day that I know of. Today's not that day. So in the meantime, we expect the world to be against us, but we don't fear it. We expect the world to be dark, but we shine the light. We win the war in the spiritual not by coming back into this building and showing the world how hard we believe or how many we can gather. We show them how much we love them by taking care of them. We show them how much we're willing to sacrifice for them. We're not swayed by every, every new teaching, every conspiracy theory, every scripture that's been twisted to condemn or every YouTube prophet who tells us the end is coming. We know the end of the story, just like it, it didn't sway us when Jesus was hung on that cross. Just like Satan didn't win when his body was laid in a grave and the stone was sealed shut, we know that three days later, Jesus wins. Love will always win. That's the end of the story. This is a scary time to live in if you're scared of things. <laughs> if you're scared of things. You've been given the fullness of salvation, so you don't have to be scared. All fear God and nothing less. Nothing less. The enemy is less. Right? The virus is less. The government is less. The economy is less. The homelessness is less. Unemployment, starvation, right? Rejection, failure, isolation. It's all less. I'll fear God and nothing less. This is a scary time to live in if you're scared of things, but I'm gonna choose to fear God and God alone because I'm called to be a solution in my world. I'm called to make a difference in the world I'm living in because as Psalm 91 says, those who live in the shelter of the Most High will find rest in the shadow of the Almighty. This 
I declare about the Lord. He alone is my refuge, my place of safety. He is my God and I trust him. For he will rescue you from every trap and protect you from every deadly disease. He will cover you with his feathers. He will shelter you with his wings. His faithful promises are your armor and protection. Do not be afraid of the terrors of the night, nor the arrow that flies in the day. Do not dread the disease that stalks in the darkness, nor the disaster that strikes at midday. Though a thousand fall at your side, ten thousand are dying around you. These evils will not touch you. Just open your eyes. Just open your eyes and see how the wicked are punished. If you make the Lord your refuge, if you make the Most High your shelter, no evil will conquer you. No plague will come near your home, for he will order his angels to protect you wherever you go. They will hold you up with their hands so you won't even hurt your foot on a stone. You will trample upon lions and cobras. You will crush fierce lions and serpents under your feet. The Lord says, I will rescue those who love me. I will protect those who trust in my name. When they call on me, I will answer. I will be with them in trouble. I will rescue and honor them. I will reward them with a long life and give them my salvation. Father, today we humble our hearts before you. Today we put you back on your throne. We put you back in your rightful place in our lives above everything else. Maybe today you've been fearing all of the wrong things. You're identifying that for the first time. I've given people, places, things, ideas, concepts. I've given them too much authority in my life. I've been fearing all the wrong things. Today I need to get my focus back on the Father. God of heaven and earth. Creator of everything in the earth. I need to get my focus back on God Almighty. I'll fear God and nothing less. Or maybe today you're saying it's time time to start living for Jesus like I know I should. I, I know I can't do this myself anymore. Can't be the person I know that I'm called to be without Jesus as the Lord of my life. Today, I want to say I'm in. I'm into following him and him alone. I'm into this, this life of vibrant faith, passionate worship, of, of selfless devotion to the people around me. I'm in to following Jesus. If you are in today, we want to say welcome to the family. Welcome to this life of purpose, vibrancy, passion, and selflessness. Welcome. And we'd love to know about it. You can type I'm in in the comments wherever you're watching this. You can go to fe.church slash I am in and let us know about it. Get all the resources for living this life. Welcome to the family. Father, today we humble our hearts. We choose to fear you and you alone. We choose to live our lives in obedience to the one and only almighty, powerful, amazing God that you are. I won't bow to anything else. I won't fear anything else. Just you. God, let your presence fall in every home, every, every car, every, wherever everybody is watching this today. Let your presence fall. Empower us. Inspire us. Convict us where necessary. Holy Spirit, come. Help us pursue you like never before. Let us dig into the word. Pray our hardest prayers understand who you are on deeper levels, on brand new levels. Father, reveal yourself to us. Help us live this life with all of the vibrancy, passion, and selflessness you've called us to so that we can be solutions, not only in our lives, but in the lives of people around us. Help us have a 
bold and brave mindset that every day we walk out of our doors, we would understand the purpose, the calling that you've spoken over our lives. Help us walk into our world as solutions looking for problems. In Jesus' name.